before we get into this episode, there's something that might be of interest that I wanted to tell you about. Seen and Heard, who uh, run this podcast, have been asked by Scotland Food and Drink to undertake a strategic review of the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards. Now, these Excellence Awards have been going for almost 20 years and are a huge mainstay of the food and drink sector. But it's time to ensure that they're still relevant. So if you have ever been involved in the Scotland Food and Drink Excellence Awards, or even if you've ever had an opinion about them, we would love for you, please, to complete our survey. So if you go to the On Farm Twitter, which is at on underscore farm uk and click the link in the bio there will be a tab in there that will take you to the survey and it should only take you a very short while to complete but we would be enormously grateful hello welcome to on farm my name's monty ross montague and you join me here in a sheep shed with some of our last year's lambs. We bring them in at this time of year, the last of the lambs, and finish them inside for basically the the butcher's trade, um, Christmas, New Year time. It got me thinking ahead of what we're gonna talk about in this week's episode, which is basically a lot about animal health, and in particular, I suppose, sheep health. To get them to this stage, we've gotta keep them healthy. And all that starts, um, all starts with vaccines and some of them they're against or they protect rather against pretty horrific and old-fashioned sounding diseases like louping ill and braxy and what have you we use the heptavac vaccine for example as a, a very simple injection into the the ewe um approximately sort of six weeks um before lambing time it protects the mother and it also gives protection to the, the unborn lamb at that stage and then the lamb. It's just a brilliant, brilliant thing that we've got because as we're going to hear in this episode, we're going to look back to the days before vaccines and all of these horrific diseases and how farmers just, you know, found sheep dead. I think our generation actually takes it for granted that these clostridial diseases are all controlled now and the, the heptavax and the covexines are all there The only way that we understand them is if we miss a year by vaccinating sheep, you come to lambing time and then you have an upside down lambing. That is the hardest thing that we can suffer from. Ayrshire livestock farmer Mungo Guthrie. We'll hear more from Mungo later. What we're going to talk about, where we're going to start off, is at the Morden Institute, Morden Foundation, a real Scottish success story based now at Easter Bush in the Penton Hills just outside Edinburgh. Morden started out in 1920, set up by a group of determined and forward-thinking Scottish farmers who were looking for new and innovative ways to cut out livestock diseases. So, 1920 to 2020, that makes this year Morden's centenary. To mark that, this is the first of four episodes we're making in the coming weeks alongside the Morden. We'll delve into their cutting-edge research and how it's helping farmers now across the globe, And coming up in this episode, we'll meet young researchers getting trained up to solve the livestock health problems of the future. I do meet an awful lot of farmers through my work. It's always interesting to go around and see different farming scenarios and to be able to give people a bit of a hand with what they're doing and informs our research quite well as well. Animal health and human health and the environment is all interconnected. And a lot of the diseases that humans get, and we, we are seeing this with COVID-19, it came from an animal, right? And so I think one great way of protecting public health is through stopping diseases in livestock to begin with. Before we fully crack on with this episode, as you'll know by now, we like to make a point of name checking and thanking folk who tag us in posts on social media. So big thanks this week to Robert Fleming, Rhett Forth Valley, Farmstock Scotland and Robert Logan. And also, I guess, many others besides who've shared, retweeted and generally flagged up our posts. Thanks to you all. Every like, every share, every recommendation to a friend or family member. It all helps us to spread the word and tell rural Scotland's stories. Now, on with today's episode. We're going all the way back 100 years to when Morden, or the Animal Disease Research Association, as it was known then, was first set up. My name's Julie Fitzpatrick. I'm Scientific Director of the Morden Research Institute 
and Chief Executive of the Morden Group of Companies and Charities. I'm also Chair of Food Security at the University of Glasgow and I currently chair the UK Science Partnership for Animal and Plant Health. I'm a board member of Quality Meat Scotland and I chair the independent scientific panel of the Scottish Aquaculture Innovation Centre. Yeah, let no one say we don't have heavyweight guests on On Farm Podcast. <laughs> Well, I'm sitting in the scientific uh, director's office in um, the Morden Research Institute. It was built in about nineteen mid nineteen nineties, so it's still quite a modern looking building. But I've got lots of old books around me, historical books covering not just the history but some of the science that was delivered. On my walls, there are pictures of the old Morden site. There's a picture of the mobile laboratory. And there's pictures of scientists going back to the 1920s. I've got two main books in front of me. The first is called A History of the Animal Diseases Research Association, or ADRA, which was the original name um, under which Morden was formed. And that was back in 1920. You know, we're really delighted that 100 years on, we're still a farmer-owned organisation. It was started by farmers wanting to sort out the science of why their animals were diseased and delighted still to be here. And I just wanted to read out something to you. It's on the first page of the history of the um, ADRA book. It was written by Richard Barnfield in the 16th century. It was called The Shepherd's Lament. And it says, My flocks feed not, my ewes breed not, my rams speed not. All is amiss. What can be the cause of this? And I really like that because it was written a long time ago, but I still think it covers, you know, Morden's raison d'etre. And if I may, my second book is actually Whores, Veterinary Materia Medica and Therapeutics. And it was written by Russell Gregg, who was the second scientific director at Morden. So he wrote this in 1924. And it's got fantastic chapters. I'm reading one at the moment, particularly, which is on the use of arsenical compounds to treat animal conditions. I mean, it just shows how much we've moved on. Definitely. That shepherd's lament, I've never heard that before. Tell us again, where did you say that come from? It doesn't actually say where it was published, but just in um, Richard Barnfield in the 16th century. So it's, it's copied here into the ADRA book, but I don't know where it's original publication, but... You know, it's, it is interesting. We've always known that, I suppose, sheep in particular have a lot of disease problems. And although we've tackled many of them, which I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss, you know, we're still doing it today and there's still new diseases emerging, not just in sheep, but in humans and all sorts of other animals. But I did particularly like, I like that paragraph. Yeah, my, my ewes breed not and my tups speed not. <laughs> Good. So... Going back then, 1920, March 1920, that's when it started. How did it start? Who was there? Why did they come together? And what brought it together? It was Scottish farmers themselves. I mean, farming in Scotland has always been really important. Livestock farming is very important because a lot of our land is very suitable for raising livestock. And of course, sheep are very important in Scotland And farmers were having trouble with their flocks. They couldn't work out what was going wrong. It was mainly death of young lambs or growing lambs. Obviously, when you lose lambs, when they're growing, you lose your your profit. You put all that work in. They also had problems with infertility in their ewes. And they wanted to find out the solutions. The the solutions weren't readily available. So they set up their own organisation to employ scientists, veterinary scientists, and animal scientists to try and find the solutions to some of these diseases. And one of the first successes was they identified that clostridial bacteria were the cause of many of these really nasty sounding diseases like Braxy and black disease and lamb dysentery. And very fortunately, the the scientists a few years later went on to develop some of the very first vaccines against clostridial disease. So it was a, a huge success. We talk about, uh, back 100 years ago, we were still talking about the same diseases with these kind of strange 
homespun, old-fashioned, if you like, names, Laupingil and Braxy and Pulpy Kidney and, and what have you. And farmers back then and now were, were scared of these diseases, but more than gave them the tools to to not be so scared. Yeah, and, and it is interesting that we still use, you know, some of these old names and they, they all sound very dramatic, don't they? You know, when we talk about louping ill to some of the scientists in, in the UK, they say, well, you know, what is louping? And you, you have to go back into the, you know, the translation of, of sheep jumping about and things. And yeah, it's, it's interesting that although science moves on, we've retained some of our traditional names. Obviously, they all have, you know, fancy scientific names as well but I rather like the the link back to some of the historic ones which are more descriptive shall we say I'll have to get my big um, veterinary book for sheep farmers out here to, to to cover all bases but we've got farmers listening there'll be some people who are very familiar with some of these terms and there'll be others who who I guess aren't so louping ill that's a, a, a tick-borne disease am I right yep yep braxy that's something I don't think I'm so familiar with. What's Braxy again? It's caused by Clostridium septicum. So it's one of the uh-huh. clostridial bacteria. So that's when I use my Heptavac and I'm, I'm vaccinating against clostridial diseases. One of them is Braxy. Yep. Yep. What would I be looking out for if I had a problem with Braxy? Like most things with sheep, it's usually sudden, sudden it's usually death. Sudden death. This is the one yep. that it's, um, it's mainly weaned lambs. So it's the slightly older lambs that tend to get Braxy. But the thing about clostridial diseases is a lot of them look the same. They have got similar patterns of yep. disease in certain ages of animals. And that's why the aim was actually to produce multivalent clostridial vaccines so that you didn't actually need to worry which type of clostridia you had. But I think the thing that marks Morden or Adra out from others is it was created by farmers, for farmers, funded by farmers initially. Um, and then, of course, they managed to draw down monies from various parts of government and other sources of funding over the years. And, and you know, the, the funding has gone up and down over the decades. But if it hadn't been started by a few very determined farmers, I don't think we would be here today. There are records of the meetings that they had. Lots of people, you know, held in Edinburgh debating how to start the organisation. It makes fascinating reading that I think the the people who did this were were quite visionary. It's brilliant, that isn't it? It's as you say, they were visionary, they were determined, they faced problems, and you know rather than face them alone on their own farms, they had the foresight to fund and employ scientists. That's you know that's just to think that that came from the farmers themselves. Yes, absolutely. And I think another key factor, though, is it was all about this kind of membership organisation. And even today, we have the Morden Foundation, which is a membership organisation. We have about 13,000 paid up members. Very modest, may I say, about £25 per annum. So it's, you know, it's not a huge investment, but it means that we have sort of clout when it comes to discussing things, not just with governments, but with funders, because we know we're representing the people who are actually benefiting from the science. And I think that's great. And we find that we are consulted by lots of people right across the world, Australia, New Zealand, and they say, you know, could you tell us how you developed your organisation? And we then go through the story and it's, it's not easy actually to replicate. I guess it's a real strength that Morden isn't a government agency, as it were, or, you know, entirely funded by government or owned by government in any way, and that, you know, independence of funding and mission. Yes, I, I would agree. I have to say the Scottish government over the decades have been incredibly supportive of our work and they have given us consistent money for medium to long term research. So they have been fantastic. But the fact that we are independent means that we can very much take the decisions made by our own board members. It gives us that ability to be a bit more agile, to plough our own furrow, (laughs) but also to deliver what Scottish Government want. And I think we've we've never seen a greater need for it than, than the current time. You know, we've got climate change, we've got environmental protection, we've got food security We've got local food production. You know, I'm a great supporter that we need to keep producing our own food from land that's suitable, in our example, for livestock. And that's a 
you know, that's a necessity, I think, going forward. It's interesting that you say, you know, we've, we've never faced such challenges. And as a sheep farmer myself, I do imagine that our forefathers, as it were, must have had it difficult. You know, they must have had it really difficult when they were staring at death and diseases that they didn't understand. And, you know, and the early scientists... It's funny to think it's only 100 years and, and you know, it, it it was totally different, wasn't it? It was, you're right. You know, you would have a dead animals or, or big parts of a flock going down and, and they were just dead. And, and, and obviously farmers and vets in those days were very interesting. They'd open them up, the carcasses, and have a look to see what was there. But it was complicated because infections are complicated. They're not always very easy. It wasn't always infections. It could be mineral deficiencies, it could be nutrition. It was a difficult thing to sort out. We've touched on the fact that Morden's owned by the farmers, it's driven by farmers and your board is made up by farmers. And we've got um, Mungo Guthrie joining us, who is a farmer from Ayrshire who has an involvement with Morden, a long-standing involvement with Morden. Is that right, Mungo? Yeah, my involvement goes back to about 2011 or 2012, when I was invited on to the South of Scotland board for the Modern Foundation. What do you think it must have been like back then, you know, 100 years ago for for the farmers who founded Morden, but even even not so much them, but, their, you know, their, their counterparts in Ayrshire and all over who had these issues and just, you know, as I said, they didn't really know what they were dealing with. What, yeah. what would you have thought of it in those days? Well, I, I think that's an interesting question because as being a young 59-year-old farmer, I'm about the average age of uh, the farmers round about. We're a generation and a half back the way. And I think our generation actually takes it for granted that these clostridial diseases are all controlled now and the, the heptavax and the covexines are all there. They don't really know and understand what they're there for. The only way that we understand them is if we miss a year by vaccinating sheep, you come to lambing time and then you have an upside down lambing. That is the hardest thing that we can suffer from. So going back to what these guys 100 years ago experienced, the hogs and the the ewe lambs were dying. What was the problem? And that's exactly what the Morden was set up for. Yes, yes, we were indeed. And... Lots of different combinations because different countries and continents have different combinations of clostridial disease. I think it's now up to a 10 in 1 vaccine in some countries for those types of infections. But, it, you know, it, it started at Morden and, you know, that's uh, that's pretty, pretty impressive. Monte, I, I would say that's the, the part that our generation takes for granted. They don't know the background to these vaccines and where they were produced, and they were produced locally. Yeah, as I say, we take it for granted that we use a vaccine. Uh, it solves all the problems clostridally within cattle and sheep. It costs pennies to actually vaccinate these uh, animals uh, to protect them. It's a great story, and it happened in Scotland and not enough people know about that. As Julie says, it, it's worldwide now. We actually have a vaccine in Australia, which is working wonders down there for the homunculus one. That's the, the bar- Barber's Pole worm, is that right? Barber's Pole. Yes, yeah. it is. Yeah, yeah. I think the only one we're looking for a cure for now is what my uh, father-in-law would refer to as want of breath. <laughs> <laughs> Quite, quite a few conditions pass <laughs> that when that's the problem. Yes. <laughs> Thanks to Julie Fitzpatrick and to Munga Guthrie. Any organisation reaching its centenary will rightly spend time reflecting on and celebrating its achievements. But what of the Morden's future? We'll hear from the next generation of researchers shortly. Firstly, Julie and Mungo talked about a mobile science lab. Back in the day, it was effectively a shepherd's hut on wheels. It went from farm to farm doing livestock research then and there. We've put up a picture on Twitter, so you'll find it at on underscore farm UK. So you can see what we're talking about and what it looked like. Literally, you know, the scientists went out in this mobile laboratory, went on to farms and would look down the microscope to see if they could see what the causes of disease were. And they did. I mean, that's the amazing thing. They didn't have the technologies that we have at the moment. But gradually, one by one, you know, they have really managed to get most of the the problems solved. The ones that we're left now, I have to say, are the more difficult ones. 
Yeah. You know, the diseases that we now have, and some of the sheep farmers yourself will probably know, some of them are really difficult because they, they're not easy to isolate the cause of the disease or it's difficult to identify methods of actually preventing the disease. So we're, le- we're left with the tough ones to deal with. Well, I'm pleased to tell you that for 2020 and beyond, there's a new mobile laboratory. It's set to go farm to farm and to rural shows up and down the country. And again, as you'll see on Twitter, this one is a lot more up to date. So here we are just at the bus and I'm just trying to open the door now that the guys have given us keys. They're a little stiff because it's new. Anyway, here we go. This is the back just opening up now. And you can see it's a bit like a TARDIS. It's very spacious in the inside. Lee Innes is Morden's Head of Communications and she showed us round the bus. So here we are in 2020 and we're just walking onto the new Morden Mobile Lab and Outreach Bus which we've just got into the Institute now and it's absolutely fantastic. Inside it's very modern. We've got microscopes, laptop computers that are attached to a smart TV so we can demonstrate diagnostics very visually. If farmers are coming on the bus, they can see how they would how we would diagnose disease on their farm. And we've also got facilities here to be able to show people to demonstrate some of those very, very new diagnostics that can give you answers in about five minutes. I think it's really interesting for the farmers also to be able to visualise what we're talking about when we say, for example, we're doing a worm egg count. They can actually look at the sample down the microscope and see what we're talking about. And having it hooked up to the smart TV means you've got a very big visual display of what we're doing. So we're hoping that this work will allow people to actually get some hands-on on what we're doing diagnostically. We've got the capacity to do modern diagnostics in the field. And we've also got the chance to do a lot of outreach work. So go back onto the farm and do some of that diagnostic work that we did in the past. Thanks to Lee Innes. Professor Lee Innes, I should say. That was just a quick sneak peek, but I'm sure we'll see more of the Morden Mobile Lab on the road soon. Next up on On Farm. I've had my own close-up experience with Morden's researchers and I've benefited from their work here on my farm as I mentioned in my chat with Julie and Mungo. One of your, your PhD students at the time called Lindsay Melville came out to visit me and she was doing some work on wormer resistance. We took a tour around the sheep and um, took some, some poo samples which she was going to take away and, and, and analyse for, for wormer resistance. It was brilliant from my point of view because... To be truthful, and I maybe sound like a bit of a dinosaur here, but to be truthful, it was the first time I had ever really even got involved in in sampling, taking the poo samples and just having someone come out and show me how to do it. And then, you know, talk me through the signs of it and not just be looking at it from the, you know, have you or haven't you got worms that you need to deal with, but actually from the resistance side of things was brilliant. She's a great example of, you know, one of our younger postdoctoral research scientists and we're really fortunate we've got uh, we've got a good number of them and these are going to be the principal scientists the the investigators of the future Lindsay can go out to a market and she can speak to farmers and pick up poo samples and sort them out but she can also come back to the lab and do molecular technology to actually understand the resistance and then you know, go back to the farmers and say, you know, this is what you have to do. I I think it's a great example of um, science in practice, the appliance of science, as we we like to call it. Yeah. Farmers are frightened from scientists. And scientists probably don't know how to interact with most farmers at that point. So it's great to have somebody like that that can go out and do both sides of it and take the message back to them. The farmer actually needs that wee wakening up at that point just to let them know that the scientist is really talking sense to them and they're actually going to be saving money within their own business, whether it's a dose or whether it's for toxoplasmosis or, you know, we really need to look at that, cut our costs within the industry and look after the the sheep that have the real problem, whether it's worms or fluke, etc. I'll just say for the listeners, you know, my, my sheep had a clean bill of health, um, no, no worm or resistance, so <laughs> they were, they're all good. It's, it's always your neighbour that has the problem with sheep farming, <laughs> isn't it? 
just to clarify, that's definitely not true of my neighbours. I couldn't possibly say that, not on a podcast anyway. Um, I'm pleased to say that researcher Lindsay, who helped me out on my farm, is with us next, along with another next generation Morden scientist, David. Hi, I'm Lindsay Melville. I'm an early career researcher at Morden. I've been there for about nine years now. I did my PhD there and I've worked on several projects relating to antelmintic resistance and grazing strategies in sheep and cattle. Hello, I'm David Smith. I'm an early career researcher at Modern Research Institute. I'm interested in all things parasites, what makes them tick and how we can come up with new vaccines, drugs and disease intervention methods to stop them. Lindsay, I don't know if you even remember, you probably meet so many uh, farmers, but you came down to meet with me a couple of years back. No, I do remember. It was good. Uh, we went round um, a number of farms uh, within the couple of months um, just talking to different farmers about how they find nematodirus, the disease on their farm, and what kind of control measures they're putting in place. And also going out into the fields with the farmers and helping them collect samples, show them what we need to do our work. I do meet an awful lot of farmers through my work. Um, it's always interesting to go around and see different farming scenarios and to be able to give people a bit of a hand with what they're doing and informs our research quite well as well. Do you enjoy that side of it, getting out and, and interacting and meeting farmers and, you know, sort of steering them on the right path, as it were? Yes, very much so. It's rewarding for people like me um, to be able to go out and see firsthand the issues that people are having on their farms and then be able to translate that back into our research. And then once we've done some work, be able to go then go out and do some knowledge exchange so yeah, it's it's nice for us to be able to see a kind of full circle. I, I, hopefully that comes out in this podcast as well, just how how much of a resource people like yourselves are to farmers like me. I mean, I would hope that I'm a kind of switched on type guy, but some of these issues, and you talk about resistance and what have you, and you, you read about it in the farming press and things like that, but trying to fully understand it, when you came to see me, Lindsay, I was almost ashamed to sort of admit that, you know, I don't quite get what this is all about. And I think that is a big strength to, to what Morden and, and, and what, what David and yourself sort of do. You you make it accessible. That's uh, nice to hear that, that we um, are hopefully making making some difference when we're out and about talking to people. It's nice to hear. I think you kind of reassured me and since then you know every what basically mid-may so lambs are starting to eat grass and what have you by that stage and every year since then I've, I've white drenched and it has made a massive difference it has i do think it is yeah it's, it's it's been a good strategy so david what are you involved in at the moment in terms of getting out and about onto farm um well over the past 12 months because of certain societal circumstances haven't had a great deal of opportunity to get out and interact with farmers directly but it's certainly part of the plan going forwards it's part of what got me to come to Morden in the first place so before this I've always worked in a university setting doing master's degree PhD and then postdoctoral research I was very interested in thinking about how can I make my research make a real world difference I don't mean to disgruntle any colleagues that I have in universities at all. Um, They do a lot of fantastic work, but I feel like with Morden, I have that opportunity to outreach a whole load more. Not to get too cheesy, but that's precisely why I got into career in science to begin with. I want to be able to make an impact, whether it's local or wider. And through Morden, I get precisely that opportunity. So not too, not a lot of experience with on farm at the moment over the past 12 months, but hopefully coming to a farm near people in the near future. By the sound of what you're saying, we're very lucky to have someone like you with, you know, an interest in vaccines and what have you, targeting your efforts towards livestock and, and, and farmers, especially in the world that we face at the moment in terms of, you know, human health and COVID and these challenges. This is a huge thing now. It's called One Health about how animal health and human health and the environment is all interconnected. And a lot of the diseases that humans get, and we, we are seeing this with COVID-19, it came from an animal, right? 
a, a lot of diseases, not just not just COVID nineteen. A, a lot of diff- diseases come either come from livestock or are shared with livestock, so they get the same kind of infections. And so I think one great way of protecting public health is through stopping diseases in livestock to begin with. It's a much more cost-effective approach, a much more pragmatic approach, in my opinion. Prevention of disease is always better than treatment of disease. And that's why I'm a big advocate of vaccines. Lindsay, you're, you're a smart cookie. you obviously gone through school, you know, thinking, what am I going to do doing all the sciences at school? What made you, why, why Morden? Why, why livestock? What made you take this path? So at university, I always knew that I wanted to get into research. But being that I'm not from a farming background at all, I hadn't really thought about agricultural research. But I did uh, my honours project for uh, fourth year at uni at Morden. Um, it was about genetics and squirrels. So I came to Morden, did that project. And whilst I was there, there was an opportunity to take up a summer student project with the parasitology department, which I thought would be good experience. So I went and did that for a summer, um, helping out on their uh, sheep grazing trials. And I just really enjoyed it. Um, I've always enjoyed uh, parasites uh, at university. I think they're really interesting. There's a lot that we don't know about them. They're ever evolving. So from a science point of view, it's a really exciting area to work in. And I just really enjoyed Morden in particular, the people and the the really applied nature of the research. That's what's kept me um, at Morden, being able to you know, complete the circle, talk to the people that are going to ultimately be using the research that I'm producing. And David, what made you want to get involved in, in parasite work and, and, and looking at all of, all of these various things? What got me into parasites to begin with was an undergrad lecturer, actually, um, when I was doing my bachelor's degree. And I did a class on parasitology and I had a lecturer who was just absolutely passionate about parasites and really made me excited about them as well. Like Lindsay's just said, they're really interesting beasts and we're learning so much about them all the time. And they're ever changing, like Lindsay said, so they keep you on your toes. Um, really interesting things to work on. So this shout out to this guy, Alan Gunn at Liverpool John Moores University, who was an absolute inspiration. So I went and I, I, I pursued a um, PhD at Queen's University Belfast on the liver fluke, which is something I'm sure you are well aware of. That was much more focused towards what molecular machinery, so what building blocks does this parasite use that cause it to be a pathogen? Then I uh, did some vaccine trials during my PhD with Modern Research Institute. I didn't get to come to the Institute directly during that time, but from the colleagues that did, they'd only had good things to say about the standard of the research that the Institute was doing. And I knew that it was an institute that worked, that was dedicated to infectious disease research and preventing the infectious disease. So that was something that really attracted me. Coming towards the end of my PhD, there was, there was a technology really starting to come to the forefront in a lot of areas of science. And this is the ability to genetically modify organisms very specifically. And I knew this would be a really powerful tool for me in addressing what makes parasites a parasite, what makes them do certain things and behave in certain ways. So I went to a lab in the US at the University of Michigan to learn skills on using that technology in in toxoplasma, so another parasite. And it was another parasite that was important to livestock. And so I kind of, although I was researching then with regards to human disease, I was acutely aware of how parasites are so important to the livestock industry and how I felt like the skills I was gaining and the knowledge I was gaining could be usefully applied in that way. And that's coming back to, I want I want to have impact with my research. I want to try and make a difference, whether it's a small or a large difference, I want to make a difference. Um, Now I've got a platform, that's kind of where we're at right now. I've got a platform now to drive my research and hopefully make an impact for farmers. And that's hopefully what the next 30, 40 years will will have in store. What what do you each think? I think, start with Lindsay you know what do you each think about the the sort of foresight of the farmers who established more than 100 years ago and invested in this what's now become you know just as David's described a a, a hugely respected institution yeah I think um I hope they'd be proud of what we've done with um what they created they clearly saw the need for it back then to have these kind of expertise build up 
to specifically focus on the issues that these they see. Yes, it's a, it's a nice story to look back and see how the Institute was formed and hopefully we've done them proud over the 100 years and we can continue to work towards a brighter future, hopefully, for the, the industry. And I think we should be incredibly proud of what they did as well. Like the, the foresight they've had 100 years ago and a lot of the diseases that they were interested in then are still important today. And we're still doing all we can to try and address those. But without them, we wouldn't have an institute like this. I think often animal research is thought about as being kind of behind human research. And that's absolutely not the case. We're absolutely at the forefront of disease research, infectious disease research. And we're, we're going toe to toe with, with, with anyone else kind of thing, with the technologies we can, we can use. If anything, better, because there's more we can do with trying to prevent disease in livestock than there is you could, that you could do in a human population. Great, great. Um, well done, guys. So thank you very much, David and Lindsay. That's brilliant. That's it for this episode from me and the sheep in the shed here. Thank you for being with us as always. Thanks to everyone at Morden for sharing their stories with us. This is the first of four episodes we're doing together, so there'll be lots more to come, including looking at their work tackling COVID-19 and the impact that Morden are having around the world in Australia and Africa, as well as here in Britain. Remember, please share our social posts and tell your friends to listen. It all helps to spread the word.